<sighs> well, here we are. Yeah. A bit nervous again, which is, uh, which is good to feel. I was talking to Anne about having this before I've spoken in the past and trying to retranslate this anticipation or excitement into something that can be used by the spirit. And yeah, it wasn't until just a few moments before that I actually had this prayer that I used to do every time in a 12 step room, I would actually, when I was called on or would, I would raise my hand, I would do that prayer of what would you have me say? And so I didn't really have any plan for today's show, but really to talk about a bit of what we talked about last week and kind of see where it took me. And, uh, yeah, so I kind of explained last week for those of you who weren't with us about how I came from a 12 step program and I had a pretty profound experience as a result of reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and practicing the steps and with the third step, which is, you know, the decision to turn your will over. I had a, uh, what the course calls revelation. And from that point, it was quite a journey actually. And I was explaining that it started all with this follow directions and it was something that I had never done before and I had started to do with my first sponsor. And it's funny because when I prayed this morning, there were certain words that I heard. And, you know, the first one was relationships. And, you know, the course tells us that our path will be different, that you will, a holy relationship will be given you. And from the moment I had that experience, it was turning over every relationship I had and seeing the people that showed up and they first showed up in the, you know, in the guise of a sponsor and sponsees and all of that. And then it continued. And, you know, that's really what it was about was actually looking at every relationship that I had and turning it over to spirit. I've heard uh, David speak about, you know, handing every relationship you have over like a deck of cards, like throwing it out and just having each one be retranslated. And, you know, that's a lot of what I've done and what it looked like. And, you know, in the program, you know, I, last week I talked about, I wanted to, you know, discuss the later steps, you know, the spiritual maintenance steps, they call them 10, 11, and 12. But it really wasn't until step nine, you know, I had this profound experience, but to come into this consistent state, it was step nine, you know, and even in the book, which I actually have here today, I actually still read it. I don't, uh, I don't put it on a shelf and forget it because it had a big impact on my life. And, you know, the promises that they, they talk about in step nine, when I first read them, I was, I was blown away because it was Bill Wilson's, you know, attempt to explain what a spiritual awakening, you know, was. And when I actually read them for the first time, I was like, yes, like, cause I had felt that. And like, I was willing to follow these directions to get back to that consistent state of mind. And maybe I'll actually read them for uh, those. Cause I know some in this room don't even know of the promises. So it starts, uh, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, and now this comes right after the ninth step, what the ninth step is, is it's like really repairing the past, they call it. It's the spiritual principle is discipline. Now we know discipline is in the mind, and it actually all starts with step three, that we make this decision. And now this is the outpicturing of this change, you know, once we straighten out spiritually, mentally, and physically. So my relationships actually started to change. So if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, talking about the ninth step, we'll be amazed before we are halfway through. We're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past or wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others that feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. And I was, when they'd asked me to read that, I used to always stress the will because that's, you know, this third step that we're handing our will over to that of the higher power. And for me, when I, I first did the ninth step, it was, you know, it was terrifying. You know, I, my first sponsor that I did it with, it was like, okay, who am I going to go do first? You know, and I had the list, I made it all out and 
lot of people that I thought I really hurt and ones and that I didn't think I owed amends to. One guy that I actually thought I owed amends and my sponsor was like, no, you owe that guy a thank you card. You know, it was like joining with him to figure out because I couldn't make the decisions myself. So I remember I was at a meeting and it was on the ninth step and we were talking about this and I was on the ninth step with my sponsor and I had a list of people that day. I had three people that I was going to go make amends to to start my process, you know. And I remember sharing it in the meeting and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go do these three people. And they were basically on my list. They were the easy ones. They were, I call them the cupcakes, the ones I could easily get done. So I left that meeting with the intention of going to the first one on my list. And as I drove, there's a, there's a split in the road. I can go two ways. I had to get gas first. And I went left to this, there was two gas stations. And I, when I went, I was down the street, maybe 200 yards, and there was three full-grown turkeys in the middle of the road. And now my nickname was actually Turk because I was such a turkey. And now that's just the symbol here. But there's three full-grown turkeys. Now, if you've ever been around turkeys, they're very spooked. They don't really stay. If they see you or anything, they, they run. And they stayed in the middle of the road. And I stopped there. And I'm like, okay, looks like. And I turned around. I go, I'm going to the other gas station. I pulled into this other gas station. I pulled into the pump. I got out when I went to grab the handle. This kid looked around the pump right at me. He was the last, the last person on my amends list that I would actually approach. We were 200 feet from the location that I was high and drunk and smashed into his mother and brother in a car in the middle of the night. I looked around the pump and I saw him and I was like, Whoa. I was like, Dom, man, I'm happy to see you. I knew it was, you know, it was given. It was for me to share my part because I was, you know, and I started to share a bit and I didn't really pray much in this moment, but I was like, man, I just want to tell you, I was so reckless. And if you could have seen the love come from this kid's eyes, he's like, man, I heard you were doing great. And the reflection was absolutely amazing. I didn't even have to say much. And I was like, oh my God. So I just started to share the joy with him. I'm like, I'm actually that later that day, I was going to speak at a corrections facility in Middletown, the next town over. I said, I'm going to speak this afternoon. He goes, I work there. I'm like, <laughs> so later that day, not only did I tell him what I was up to, later that day, I saw him in the parking lot of the place I went. So he could see it was, you know, something I was actually living. And from that point forward, I knew that I, I wouldn't have to be afraid of anything that I went towards, any of these relationships that I thought I had completely damaged, whatever it was. The next person on my list later that day, I'm driving down the street and sure enough, I'm driving by this house. I'm like, all right, make it obvious if he's outside. This was a friend of mine that I grew up with. He owned the local bar. He threw me out forever. Wasn't allowed in, in his place. And sure enough, he's never home. He walked out of his house to walk his dog and I pulled in and yeah, I had some tears there and I shared with him, you know, my part in it all the way that the program works. And it was absolutely amazing to see that once I was willing to give it over and it all started with that, you know, that deep prayer originally. And some of them looked really different, but it's this idea that if I'm willing to actually give them over, I'm not, it's not up to me. You know, as the course says, the curriculum's not up to me. I just have to be willing to see what happens. And probably the next one I, yeah, now they're just starting to come to me. This, this was before my, my next sponsor. And this was probably one of my best friends that, whew, yeah, he had seemed to steal a bunch of money from me and he was on my list and I wasn't sure how to address this one. And it was, uh, it was in June and I was leaving for a month to go up into the woods to do a hermitage of my own and yeah, I remember it clearly the day I was, the, I was leaving the next day and I was driving to an appointment. I had no intentions of talking to this guy at all. And I pull into this parking lot of the appointment and he pulls in behind me. He gets out of his car and it is the same experience. Hey, how you doing? It was like nothing ever changed. Like our relationship, like it was when, when we were in high school, we used to go up to this cabin, the two of us with other friends to fish and do our things and drink and all that. And I told him, I'm leaving tomorrow. And he's like, when you get back, we should, you know, we should go golfing. We should do this. And I said, yeah, here, you know, he was walking a lot. And I'm like, yeah, maybe we'll go for a walk. And he's like, yeah, you know, the Bob Chee's feeding me. And, you know, it was, it was like this interaction that was amazing. And tears came up, but it was like this. There was a piece underneath it because it was like I was able to have that, that healing or that connection with him again. 
And this was all a result of me just handing over these relationships. And it was like, yeah, I forgot all about that one. Hmm. Yeah, so what it looks like now, today, uh, I'm in relationship with everybody in this room, essentially. I have a wife here, which is a surprise. But this is the course, you know, a holy relationship will be given. I never thought I would be married. I was terrified because I'd had broken hearts in the past and all that. And, and now I get to practice these things in a deeper way. And this is what, you know, coming from a 12-step program and coming into being in relationship with everyone, you know, it really is, there's no words to really describe it. You know, the holy relationship is transferring the love I can share with one to everyone. And it's like, yeah, I guess we can get to that. But my other, uh, my other experience with this, with this step before I got into the, the tenth step and, you know, healing these relationships was with my second sponsor, Big Book Bill. And this guy was like, yeah, he was the most loud spoken guy in the room. And I picked him. And when he made me do these steps, when he made me do step nine, he had me write out cards. This was my introduction to like intense mind training because I wrote out the person, the people. And I, you know, I was doing this again for ones that still weren't healed. You know, ones like my mother, my father, all these things. And so when I did them, I actually wrote out on an index card. This was my part in, you know, I was selfish when I, I was inconsiderate when I, and I would explain things that really felt, you know, deep. When I actually did the step in the room and writing them down, it was clear. I had no emotion. It was like, yep, I did this. I did this. And when I actually wrote them all down, I was like, this is going to be no problem. And I was directed to make an appointment with them, bring my card over, make a copy, hand it to them. I hold mine. I read the stuff. And then there's a question that I ask. And the question was, what can I do to make this right? And then it just said, shut up and listen. And to me, it was shut up and watch my mind and see where I wanted to defend or whatever it was. And I remember I did this with all my main ones, you know, my cousin, my best friend, Ace, my brother, you know, my mother and my father. And I thought it was, you know, when I did it with my mother and father, it was, it was amazing. I walked in and I handed him the card and I made it clear that this is what I was here for. We're not talking about anything else and I'm leaving right after. And when I did this, I actually, the deepest part I got to, the one, the one thing was this, I never allowed people to love me. You know, I, I wasn't able to do that. So when I actually said that in front of my mother and my father, I mean, I burst into tears. It was like, I'm sorry for not allowing you to love me like a son. And when I said that to him, it was like they were crying and it was like, and then I would shut up and listen and like, what can I do to make this right? And it was always nothing, you know, you don't have to do anything. And then I packed one, you know, packed up and left. And it was like, this was the beginning, these steps of like looking at these things in, in my mind that led me to, you know, wanting to go deeper. And I spoke last week about having that dream about David and calling Jason and coming to Mexico. And when I came to Mexico, I sat in the awareness center in Chapala and I was doing, I was in the uh, mystical mind training at the time and I was doing these instrument for pieces, you know, and I was doing all this stuff and I was, the turnarounds I did when I was there, I went after these bigger things. Like the first one, when I was sitting there, I was like, I was there for like four or five days and I pretty much stayed in my room and forced myself to do these things. And the biggest one was my father because he was my biggest resentment. He was my biggest, you know, what I perceived as controlling me. And I sat and I went through these turnarounds and it was like, the thought is my father wants to control my life. And when I wrote that down and I was actually trying to force myself to think of the, you know, if you've ever done those turnarounds, it's like the opposite to actually think of those things. I couldn't do it. It was like, it was such prayer because I was so certain I was so right about this belief in my mind. And it was keeping me unhappy that it took me days. It didn't happen right away. It took me days to actually see, Oh wait, here's a way that he didn't want to control me. It was very subtle at the time. And it wasn't a huge shift in my mind when I wrote these out. It was like, Oh no, he let me do this or he wants me to do this. He supports me in this. And so I went through and I did them all. 
And it wasn't this big pop. It wasn't this amazing thing because these were deep beliefs in my mind. And, but when I went home, I went home and when I, when I went to my father's house, my experience with my father actually changed. Certain things in the house, I used to have a seat that I would come in on the island, like I would come in for dinner on Wednesdays and he would have a list laid out for me. Things that he wanted me to do, check on this, money issues, whatever it was, it'd be sitting there. It disappeared. He used to call me and tell me to come to, work, come to have dinner with my mother. You owe it to your mother, you gotta come every week. He never called again. I was never asked to come over on Wednesday night. Now this was the reflection I had just by questioning this idea that my father wants to control me. And it went on, you know, this, this was a deep wash for me because it was like, this was my biggest victim belief that I couldn't do the things I wanted to do in life because I was being controlled by my father or whatever it was. And yeah, it started to, it started to make a huge difference in my life as I started to take the course and implement it into these interactions that I had learned to start doing with, you know, the 12 steps. And then it started to be, you know, when I got into the responsibility, the responsibility of the site. Now I knew from the, from AA that, you know, it was a self-imposed crisis. And what I shared last week, you know, our problems are basically of our own making. But when I read the responsibility for site section, I was like, oh yes, I am responsible for what I see and hear. Because with my father, it was always, these comments or things that I took personally, you know, fool, you ain't going nowhere. When I actually heard him say that and heard, I love you for the first time, I was like, I was like, Oh my God, this is the way this man is showing his love for me, you know? And actually that section is probably, I have like three sections that I read over and over. And that one's probably the most influential to me. I read it most mornings because that's what I'm doing here. And like when I'm talking about following directions in the book, it says, you only need to do this. I don't even need to do the rest of the book. You only need to do this for vision, happiness, escape from pain, complete release from sin. And it's like, and then it says the next line, it says, say only this and mean it with no reservations. And when I read that, it's like, you know, to mean it. And that's what happened with me in the first step. It's like, concede to your innermost self that I'm powerless over alcohol was my case. When I did that, it was lifted. You know, I didn't have any desire to drink or do drugs when I actually conceded to myself that I was powerless. Now it was taking it to the next step. And it was like, all right, I need to say without reservation that I am responsible. And then it says, that this is the power of salvation. This is where the power of salvation lies. I'm responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience. I decide upon the goal that I would achieve. Oh, I gotta take a drink. And then everything that seems to happen to me, I've asked for. I've received in, uh, as I've asked for. And when I actually do that in every moment, that's what we do, you know, in this community and the people I live with, like there's never an opportunity to actually place the blame. There's never an opportunity to play victim. It's always this opportunity to stand, you know, in our strength. And yeah, it was funny. I, uh, as I was watching Emily's show and listening to Netta and I was there when she sang that at, uh, San Francisco. And it's like, every time they sing, even Emily, she sings out in the garden. When I first got here, I got to the monastery and I remember waking up and she'd be like prancing through the garden, singing her songs. And I was like, it was like dreamlike. <laughs> it was like so incredible. And then when I hear Netta sing at San Francisco, it's like, I'm filled with this, you know, these chills or these goosebumps. And so we're actually starting, starting a, a little group here in our house where we come together to sing and I'm terrified to sing completely terrified because I think I have a terrible voice. And what happened? I was probably told, I can't even remember this. I actually prayed and meditated on this. At some point, I think everyone was told that they had a bad voice and I believed it. Like I believed it so deeply that I would never sing again. And now when I actually start to sing, I remember I used to start singing and I'd be like, I know I have a bad voice. Like I'd preface it with that. And these are all just the same beliefs manifesting in a different way to show me that, but none of it's true. It's like anything that happens or anything that I see reflected is actually, I'm responsible for what the way I feel. It's nothing to do with anything out there. So I'm actually making a public statement that I'm gonna to come to the next 
singing thing so that I can walk through that because I am scared. I actually did a voice liberation with, uh, oh, I see Eric up there. I was singing with Eric in San Francisco too. And I did that voice liberation. And when I did that, I did it once by myself and then I did it once with, Su once with Susanna, which you'll see in our upcoming documentary. But when I actually did it, I had an experience like I did a fifth step. It was like I did a fifth step. Every time I did a fifth step or received a fifth step from someone else, I had this feeling of being light, of being, you know, lifted. I had the same feeling after stepping through this fear of liberating this voice that I think, you know, doesn't need to be heard or whatever it is. It's like, it's funny that lifted feeling, it always comes to me after I'm healing something, a belief or a relationship. When I was in Camus one time, I had a call with my best friend Ace. And I was kind of, I was really scared. Certain ones I would send emails to and say, hey, I'm training my mind here, whatever I was doing. And certain ones I would continue to talk to. And Ace, I knew it was time that the calls were about his kids and just wasn't supportive for what, was, what I was going through at the time. And I kind of told him, I was like, hey, Ace, uh, you know, why don't you email me? And this was someone I used to talk to all the time. And he used to always give me a hard time for not calling. But at this time, I said, you know, I'll call you or, you know, kind of just letting go of that attachment to specialness with my best friend, which was very difficult. And I remember when I hung the phone up, I actually got up. I was, I was in the uh, room five with Nicholas and I think Eric at the time. And I was just, I walked, I didn't know where I was going. I walked down to the library and I reached up and I pulled a book off the shelf and it was called uh, mirror on still water, this book that was there. And I just flipped it open. And the paragraph that I read was, we are held here by the gravity of our unhealed relationships. I was like, whoo, <laughs> I put it back and I was like, whoa, that's heavy. Like, that's what I'm doing here is like healing these relationships over and over. And now being in this context, I'm able to have these relationships reflected in all the people I live with. Like my wife, she's actually my brother, my mother and my father. <laughs> <laughs> at different times, <laughs> my friend Bigger B, like I can go through the list, <laughs> like at certain times. I remember at the first retreat I went to, like I went to a devotional for two weeks and I sat in the expression session. And I was like, oh my God, I looked around the room and I was like, okay, he's my mother. He's Ken's my father. And it was like all these people that were surrounding me were actually reflecting these unhealed pieces of my mind. And it was like, yeah, it blew me away to see that. And then the next step was actually to start working on those things. So all my authority issues come up probably with different ones, but they actually come up in this environment so that I can look at them so that I can actually take responsibility for sight. And it's like, this is what allows me to live in this place of the miracle and do all those things. So, oh. so we got seven more minutes here. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, actually, Frank, my uh, Frank that I spoke of last week is flying in today. It's funny because I told him that he would probably be the first uh, first guest on my show because he has been uh, part of the 12-step movement for 30 years, founded 12-step programs out in France. And, and he's coming down here and he's flying in at five o'clock tonight. And I told him probably next week I could have him on the show to share because he's actually making the same, the same type of shift to, from this, you know, the daily. And I, I had a few messages that came in last week that were like, yeah, I was in, I was in AA and, for 30 years and I, I quit or I was in for a certain amount of time. I don't know that I ever quit. You know, I actually went to a meeting with Andrew. I think Andrew's up there somewhere. I went to a meeting with Andrew when he was here for a month. And I got to tell you, I still get a lot out of it. You know, it's like this idea. I was talking with Jason the other day. Even if I left community for some freak reason, we said it was like, it's not like I would leave. It's like the ministry is in my mind and like, AA, hey, hey, I still feel is that way for me. It's like, it's always a part of me, that fellowship. I don't think I could let go of. Certainly I'm loosening from the idea that I am an alcoholic. It's like, I actually stopped saying that before I found the course. I think I was listening to Wayne Dyer and he was like, I am that I am. And 
everything that follows and I am is the name of God. I'm like, well, I'm not, God's not an alcoholic. I don't think so. So I changed it to when I would introduce myself, it would, I would just say alcoholic Jeffrey. I would just say it that way so that I could let go of this idea of that. I am that it's my identity. And then, yeah, I actually, uh, I was talking with Jason about this as well. And there was, you know, there's, when you start to read the course and it's like accepting, I am the son of God. I think I shared that as well, that the first time I said that I was terrified. I said it in a meeting. I was like, I just want to say that I am the son of God. <laughs> I was like, I was like to watch the fear to even say that, like what Netta was talking about, this fear of singing that song and meaning it and like, this unworthiness that I can say it. And when, when I said it, I saw the unworthiness around it. And like, then it became easier and easier and showing me what was in the way of that. But people that I'd been, I, Jason talked about a story of a guy he knew that was in the program for 30 years. And he's like, yeah, I've done the course. I had another guy back home that said, Oh, of course of miracles. Yeah, I did that. I'm like, you did it. I'm like, okay, well, if you did it, you probably wouldn't be here. But the, uh, the point is, it's like same with 12 steps. You don't say to someone you did it. No, I live that or whatever it is. So yeah, this idea of letting go of this idea of I am an alcoholic was, was pretty strong for me. And there's still something around it because I remember when I was so, I was so devote on the fact that I wasn't for 39 years. And then when I found out I was, I was so proud that I was, was like, Oh, it was like this, this shift, like this pride in the opposite direction. So I noticed that pretty quickly, pretty early on. And then even having talks with my sponsor at the time and my sponsor introduced himself as a recovered alcoholic because of the way the text is written. So he got into a lot of debates, but yeah, I'm not actually here to even debate any of it. It's like, I really just want to share what, what happened to me, like the steps I took and start to have some guests on so that we can talk about steps that they're either taking, want to take or have taken, you know, and I got a few emails from people that, you know, were very interesting and I'm going to explore that maybe this week and yeah, and go from there and we can talk about the last step, which isn't taken by us, fortunately. So I just have to do the rest of the work and then the last step is taken by God. So yeah, I want to thank you for having me today into your living rooms and I will turn it back over to Peter and Kristen. <laughs>